from the Catholic Underground. Today on the show, time travel in North Korea, time travel in your household appliances, and taking time to mourn with hope. Our picks of the week and so much more. The Catholic Underground starts right now. Well, it is time for the CU Weekly, cutting through the noise of the digital continent. It's episode number 292. I am Father Chris Decker. If you are listening live, you can join us in the chat room at catholicunderground.tv and get your second screen experience on. Joining me this week, we've got Olivia Galino, the student of life, our resident Italian food critic, and she's drinking coffee today to, uh, to help pepper up. Hey, Olivia. <laughs> Hello, Father. That's right. We've also uh, got Chris Williston. He is husband and father and president of the Mary Claire Project, about which you'll learn plenty before the night's end. He's also one of our fellow undergrounders, and uh, I would say that you are our bureau chief of the Austin uh, uh, office. You know, Hey, Chris. Hey, oh, good and to see you. <laughs> Also, uh, Jeff Blackwell, who's the technical director of the CU. He's the commandant of the Jeff Star 1 near-Earth orbit satellite. Yep. Hey, Jeff. Hello there, Father. And Ed uh, Ed Ball is on the ball. He is switching the video, and boy, oh, boy, um, I'm excited because I know for a fact that uh, that a few of you are watching on Roku. You're watching us live, uh, so you're getting the, the completely raw, ed- unedited, uncut version of the show. And um, so thank you for joining us online on Roku on podcast, all of the ways in which you get the Catholic Underground, uh, and we're happy that there are so many ways in which we can come into your home, uh, or your car, or um, your travel pod, whatever it is. Okay, so I like time travel as much as the next guy. Uh, North Korea, actually, is going to time travel back in time, about 30 minutes. Uh, so talk about uh, Kim Jong-un making a, an early, getting an early pizza delivery. Uh, <laughs> Okay. This is an extremely strange story, Olivia, because I have heard about, um, you know, certain areas of the world observing a different time zone than the one that would kind of cascade in their direction. So, like, uh, if we are negative 6 GMT, well, the folks next to us in the time zone would be negative 5, and on the other side would be, you know, negative 7. Mm-hmm. It seems logical and just kind of goes all the way around the globe to the international dateline and starts over. Well, North Korea is, is going to do more than just switch a whole hour. They're going to go from plus 9 GMT to 830 GMT. Mm-hmm. So they're going to travel back in time. Their entire country is going to travel back in time <laughs> 30 minutes. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so that, well, I mean, I'm not, I, I think the only thing I can think of is so that you get your pizza earlier. So that the moment that you order it, it should be there. right at your door. Yeah. Maybe not. I, yep. can, I can get behind that. Or maybe so that if you miss the episode of Full House on Nick at Night, uh, they start over. That's what it is. Because I think, Which, uh, you know, public television in North Korea, that's one of the only shows. I hear the Olsen <laughs> twins are huge in Pyongyang. They, oh uh, they are. They are. Yeah. yeah. Which um, is actually where they are right now, I think. I, th- I think I think the way that you translate Full House, though, uh, in, into, into, into the North Korean dialect is uh, house with too many men. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I think we can all agree on that. I think we can. That's right. Exactly. Uh, so, so that's uh, that's it, the thing. I, mm-hmm. uh, I, I I guess what uh, from the Guardian article, um, Kim Jong Un as well as uh, his his military cadre are attempting to make an even bigger break with um, with what they call the Japanese colonial period, the time in which Japan uh, had control over them, uh-huh. and so the the uh, the time change is going to coincide uh, a little bit later this month with Korea's liberation from the Kingdom of Japan at the end of the Second World War. Mm -hmm. And so they're kind of establishing a sovereign Pyongyang time uh, so that they can, uh, what their their official state agency says is an opportunity to root out the legacy of the Japanese colonial period. And one of the things I find interesting, uh, Chris, is, is that this is one of those attempts to kind of overwrite history in a sense, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and we're actually doing some of the same stuff in our own country. Mm-hmm. Is is we're attempting to even if it's a, a dark part of our of our history, we just kind of overwrite it with something else. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's that's exactly right. Uh, it, it, it's it's amazing to me that people have this idea in their mind that if we can just somehow uh, press the reset button, yeah. pretend like things didn't happen, 
you know, and, and what about that whole, what about that whole idea of learning from history, kind of holding it up and, and maintaining our yeah. history so that, you know, we may actually learn something from it. Um, that just seems to have gone by the wayside and, um, just to, to be overridden by, I guess, political correctness yeah. or at least a sense that, Hey, you know what? We, if we just pretend like this, this didn't happen, then we can ignore all the ugly parts of our past. Mm-hmm. And, and Jeff, uh, I, I think we can all agree that uh, the best way to, to not repeat history mm-hmm. is to actually learn history, right? I mean, oh, no, we don't want to do that. <laughs> Silly. Those Easterners. That sounds really? hard. <laughs> That's <laughs> too hard. Let's get back to Full House. Yeah. And yeah. hey, where's the pizza? <laughs> That's right. And where is that pizza? <laughs> so, uh, Olivia... Would you, if you had the opportunity to create your own like bubble of personal time, right? Or do you? I well, I I would believe that I do. Yeah. I, no one else observes it, but <laughs> yeah, the sovereign Olivia standard <laughs> yes. time. Well, I mean, we we make that joke too that that there are um, brother priests and and even parishioners and probably mm-hmm. members of our families that seem to kind of be observing what Kim Jong Il is doing or Kim Jong Un I should say is doing mm-hmm. is they they have this kind of personal sovereign time mm-hmm. that they're usually about 5 or 10 minutes uh, removed from everybody else that i that wholly applies to me because when i say i'm going to be on time it means i'm going to be about 7 minutes late oh okay well at least you've got a, a hard figure down yeah, yeah it's i yeah. mean 7 plus or minus maybe 2 minutes I'm pretty consistent. It turns out that this is not something new mm-hmm. uh, with uh, the, the establishment of a, uh, a sovereign time because even uh, the kingdom of Nepal, Nepal actually is, is uh, at GMT 545. Mm-hmm. Oh. So it's 15 minutes ahead of Delhi. Um, it's, uh, it's a rather large na- neighbor. Which so, I think is what they do with TBS programming during the 90s. Remember? That's true. All those episodes yeah. Yeah. start like at, at 5.34. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 5.05. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's because they were always waiting for an Atlanta Braves washout, you know, a rain out. Oh, so, <laughs> so, <laughs> so they were Again, trying no, to do it. This, this really just goes back to full house because that's what I was waiting on for those four extra minutes. Well, of course. Oh, it exactly. always comes back to full house. I think I, maybe I, that I there is that. a lot to your uh, – to your your notion that this this thirty minute shift back in time is for that, mm-hmm. I, <laughs> I, I I I will say I don't like I don't like this this tinkering with time at all. I and even here in the United States, you have some states that don't observe daylight savings time. I right. think Indiana is one of yeah, them. South Bend and, doesn't. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Um, as well as uh, Arizona doesn't. And so mm-hmm. one time I landed in Phoenix to make a connecting flight. And um, oh. and thought, what has Southwest done to me? I have 15 <laughs> minutes to get completely across for this airport because, of course, I assumed that we were going back an hour or whatever yeah. it was. Took off running, only found I had about an hour and 15 minutes, and just messed with my brain. Mm. That's right. You didn't have to eat those cheese sticks as fast. Uh, yeah, I I really wolfed down that uh, that windy spicy chicken sandwich, and I regretted it the entire afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> And everyone else <laughs> suffered because nobody <laughs> observed daylight That's savings right. time in Arizona. <laughs> See, yeah, the yeah. perils of time travel. How, how mm. Olivia, how do you feel about daylight savings time in general? D- is it is it disconcerting to you? I know it takes me almost a year to mm. figure it out, and then we've switched again. I don't mind it so much. I it is hard to adjust to, mm. um, and it's a bit odd to think of. You know, we're just going to arbitrarily decide that on this day. It's going to be an hour later or an hour earlier than it was yesterday. That's not natural. I no. don't know. Because nature doesn't observe that law. You know, for a plant, it is a certain time of day, whether or not you say you yell at the plant, no, it's 5 o'clock. It's not 6 o'clock. <laughs> don't you, you open know? those petals. That's don't right. even. I see it. I see it. <laughs> but, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't have so much a problem with it, but it is something that it's a little odd when you just think about, you know, man trying to manipulate time. Mm-hmm. And of course, I, I think that there is a real theological connection with this too, because mm-hmm. Olivia and I were talking uh, at the top of the show uh, about phenomenology. Yes. Which, um, <laughs> you know, just of just, just casual are. conversation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. Like, you know. But well, the no, but the notion that phenomenology <laughs> looks at the thing in and of itself, it mm-hmm. observes the thing in and of itself, and it allows the thing in and of itself to inform um, inform what we believe about it. It mm-hmm. allows us to, to apply uh, our gift of reason to that particular thing. Mm-hmm. And um, it allows us to, to see it in all of its beauty. Mm-hmm. Um, and time is a beautiful thing. 
Yeah, and it's also, you know, a creature. If you listen to Augustine, time, yeah. time is a creation. You know, it's not something that exists for God. It's something that exists for us. And I, I mean, I personally think that time is a merciful thing, you know, because mm-hmm. if everything were to happen all at once, then human beings would just implode on themselves. But, yeah, I, I, I think that you're right to say that we getting back to the things themselves and letting them speak and for themselves in a certain mm-hmm. sense instead of us trying to no, you mean this, yeah. um, is, is really important because then you're listening to nature. You're not trying to, um, impose and yourself like, on it. That's also like a health movement once again, right? Mm-hmm. Is l- the notion of listening to your body, mm-hmm. uh, listening to the rhythms of your body. Uh, and it's, it's funny how we seem to take so much time <laughs> trying to, to, to rework things and fit them into these little itty bitty things that they don't fit into these categories. They don't fit into when, when nature itself, uh, all of created things, mm-hmm. were created by someone outside of time mm-hmm. in, order, in an ordered way so that we can live with order, with right. reason. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, whenever we manipulate time or think that we're manipulating it, mm-hmm. uh, it really says a lot about, uh, I wonder if there's not a little bit of concupiscence in, in all of this. You know? Oh, I can. I, I mean, obviously, so. Kim Jong-un was just saying, ha. I can do this, mm-hmm. and I can I can swing all the clocks back thirty minutes in my kingdom, in my you know, in my republic, and <laughs> in my democratic republic. Uh, <laughs> uh, but but it's actually I think that there might be a little something, and I just think about my own day, how I try to manipulate time, oh, yeah. rather than allow myself to to be guided by time from mm-hmm. sunrise to sunset. Mm-hmm. That's of course why yes. the liturgy of the hours is beautiful. Mm. C.S. Lewis had a really a beautiful thought about time as well, which he said, you know, you notice how often us human beings are surprised by time. Like, my, wh- where's the year gone? I can't believe it's already been so long. It's just like time almost has a way of sneaking up on us. Yeah. And, uh, and Lewis said that in and of itself is proof that we are connected to the eternal, that we Ooh. are eternal, mm-hmm. that our souls are eternal. Because time, time, while it is a reality of the world that we live in, uh, we are made to live outside of time, mm-hmm. and we do. And our souls are eternal. We live outside of time with God, and that is a pretty mind-boggling thought. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the fact that we are surprised by time, mm-hmm. because Constantly. there will there will once be a time, there will once come a time <laughs> where we know not time, where right. we're in 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 Kairos, where we are in God's eternity. Mm-hmm. Precisely. Um, and and of course, that's really one of the beautiful things about the liturgical year, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Is that the liturgical year is ordered. time. Time, pardon me, ordered time, but it is ordered in such a way where it allows us to experience something of the eternal. Right. That's I, that is what really just blows me away. Uh, with the liturgy of the hours, over the course of a twenty-four hour period, there are set times for the liturgy of the hours. Mm-hmm. Um, but at whatever hour you're able to celebrate them, because um, you know what what I might be celebrating as midday prayer. Uh, might be 2.45 for me, mm-hmm. um, but that might be uh, 2 o'clock at one monastery and 1 o'clock in the other. And so if you think about it, it is, it is the beauty of prayer, of the liturgy of the hours, that is inserting into the time frames in which we are given an opportunity to raise our mind and heart to God. Mm-hmm. And so prayer is happening pretty much um, on every minute of every day right. by someone praying, by, right. by an official prayer of the church like the liturgy of the hours, or by some, one of the sacraments being celebrated. Mm-hmm. And so whenever we enter into a, a liturgical period, like the Mass or the Liturgy of the Hours, we're using time to experience something timeless, time with God. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I heard once that um, you know, mass, the Mass is where heaven and earth meet. Mm-hmm. Um, and I often have that experience in Mass when I just I, I get out and I'm like, was that only an hour? I feel like I, I completely lost my sense of time. Yeah. And I think that that's... You a, exited it. Right. Yeah. I exited time. And when I came back to it, it was a little jarring. You know, like mm-hmm. the world is still going on, but I wasn't here for a, for yeah. a little bit. Um, so Good vacations do that too. Mm-hmm. You know, it's true. Where, where all you do is you're, you're aware of sunrise and sunset. Yeah. And uh, it's always something I bet, Jeff, whenever you come back from a, one of your little getaways, when they happen, mm-hmm. yeah. is uh, the world itself can be jarring and loud because, yeah, sure can. because you, you realize that there was a time in which you were, you were enjoying life. Yeah. And now you have to kind of step back into a life that may not be moving at the speed that, yeah, that you want. You know? Kind of tippy toe into it there. Yeah, but, uh, exactly. but you're absolutely right. It is nice to get away. And, and it, that uh, what you were talking about, Olivia, happened today in Mass. It was just like, 
all of a sudden, you know, I was uh, just in a, in a, in just, I don't know, set apart from the world yeah. mm-hmm. and uh, lost track of time. Yeah. And that's what the mass does. Yes, that's, that's good. That's the beauty that's of very it. Good. Um, <laughs> Jason in the chat room uh, says toddlers don't care about daylight savings. Time. They just get up <laughs> at 6 a.m. instead of 7 a.m. <laughs> <laughs> they also don't care about mass all that much either. They, <laughs> you really want to be connected back to the uh, the, t- the timeliness of mass. Yeah. Then uh, then go with a toddler. That's right, because <laughs> they will always know whenever um, the the sermon is beginning. Mm-hmm. Um, they will know pretty much the midpoint of the sermon. Mm-hmm. They will know the exact moment of the consecration. And the, yes, <laughs> that's right. I've noticed that. Yeah. yeah. And do you know, also, for me as a priest, uh, the the consecration of the chalice. For me, for some reason, is the one that gets all, the most noise. It's shiny. I, I don't know if it's shiny or not, but I, I I always wonder what's going on there because the consecration of the host, I almost never hear anything. But the consecration of the chalice, there's always if there's going to be a noise or something or a distraction. Yeah, it's at the consecration of the chalice. I don't know if there's anything to that. Hmm. I, don't know. I will say we had a we had a special little talk from a seminarian at the end of uh, mass today uh, here in the um, at, at my home parish. And you could you could audibly hear all of the parents of toddlers there in the church kind of go, oh, <laughs> oh <laughs> to know long. that mass was just going to be a little bit longer. That's right. <laughs> we experience Kronos after the post communion <laughs> prayer. Yeah. There was a little bit of Kronos uh, going a, on. A little reentry. Yeah. Uh, William Cosgrove in the uh, chat says that on board the International Space Station, they run on GMT. And periodically have to update the time uh, due to relativity by a few seconds. Oh wow! I yeah, that will cool. blow the mind. I totally understand right that. There. Yeah, I just, I guess they're they're folding space <laughs> up there. I guess that's what, <laughs> what it, you know. Um, and then uh, and then Jason says the thousand plus emails don't help you when you come back from vacation. Either. <laughs> that actually that's one thing that helps you realize uh, very quickly that uh, yeah time was happening while yeah. you were outside of it mm-hmm. on vacation yeah, or on true. pilgrimage or something like or on retreat. Um, so yeah, but time is is uh, is a terrible thing to waste uh, mm-hmm. because because time is a gift from God, and um, you know uh, that's one of the one things that we are always trying to grab more of is time. Mm-hmm. Um, in fact, our society is always trying to to grab time. Um, so maybe you need to take a, a plane trip to North Korea if you'd like to just take thirty <laughs> seconds off. I don't know. Yeah, just get a little little extra time. In fact, I started thinking about this. What would I do with an extra thirty minutes and and after I kind of broke through all the really great ideas, I came right down to it. Well, I'd probably just waste it on Facebook. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Don't we all? Right. Yeah. I feel like I would waste well. it too. Don't worry. Well, I guess it's uh, that time for us to tell you that we are the Catholic Underground. You can find us and subscribe to us on YouTube at youtube.com slash Catholic Underground. Do it today. You are listening to the Catholic Underground. We are online at catholicunderground.tv. I'm Father Chris Decker playing imaginary musical instruments. Jeff Blackwell joins us. Olivia Galino joins us. And we are joined by a special guest this week, uh, fellow undergrounder Chris Williston, who is broadcasting from uh, his little uh, his little broadcast pod there in his home in Austin, Texas. Hey, Chris. Hello there. We're going to take a little bit. We're going to take a look at why you are here a little bit later. Uh, but first... Could the Mr. Fusion really be a thing? And could it really power your home car or your fax machine so that you can fire somebody? Mm. Because, you know, in 2015, yes. that's the way that it's done. That's right. Mm-hmm. According, mm-hmm. according yep. to, uh, to AT&T, actually, I think it was. Uh, yeah. So it's 2015. It's the year that Marty McFly went back to the future. It's the year that Doc Brown uh, encountered all manner of wonders, and including 3D movie trailers that actually happened outside the movie theater, the hoverboard, Pepsi bottles with weird <laughs> lids, um, and black coffee, I suppose, too. Um, you might remember the, the small device that gave the DeLorean, the time machine, its unlimited fuel, fuel supply. It was a little thing on the back called the Mr. Fusion, yes. a household reactor. Yeah. Well, we don't have our hoverboards yet. I don't know, unless, unless in Austin they have them. I bet do. We do. We yeah. do. Yeah. Man! Yeah, they'll get, they'll get to your part of the world before long, I'm sure. It's all of the hipsters. The hipsters <laughs> bring about these... These, uh, the hipsters with technology degrees. Yeah, yeah. exactly. They actually run on Topo Chico. <laughs> that's that's the secret. Uh, yeah, and are you familiar with this beverage? This. I am totally yeah. lost now. What, what is that? <laughs> you must tell me. 
Yeah. It's like a hipster bubbly water. Yeah, it's oh. it's water with a, a little hint of lime. So it's uh-huh. carbonated water with a little hint of lime. Mm-hmm. And it is it is one of the the hipster uh, beverages of choice in in Austin at least, and I enjoyed it in my mm. time there. I was uh, either reintroduced or introduced to it. I don't remember. I think I'd had it before. Is it available on Amazon? <laughs> uh, I bet it is. If you, but only as hoverboard board fuel. That's right. That's right. Hoverboards do take <laughs> they do. the Topo Chico. It's the fizzliness that makes them run. Uh, that's right. It's the fizzliness that gotcha. makes it possible. Gotcha. I think there's your ad campaign right, <laughs> right there for 2015. <laughs> so, so we don't have the hoverboard yet, at least not here in Louisiana. Um, but it turns out that private fusion reactors might be a thing in the not-so-distant future. So there's a, a company that is working with Lockheed. So so Lockheed Martin, right, the, the folks that develop jet engines, they have an aerospace program. They're really serious about actually making things happen, right? Um, the, the, the company that's working with Lockheed is called Skunk Works. Now, of course it is. <laughs> no, no, no. If that's a fact, yeah. Well, I think uh, if you live out where I do in, in the middle of the rural area, you always know that skunk works. <laughs> it's just that's the way that it goes. Anyway, so they want to develop a product that uh, they claim will be ready for prime time in about 10 years. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and it is actually a fusion reactor uh, as opposed to a fission reactor which I believe is what we use today, those big, large things uh, that, uh, that power nuclear plants. Uh, that's nuclear fission. But nuclear fusion is a different type of technology that, that has been, um, up until now, very difficult to achieve. Yeah. And so they, they have this, this device, and, and they call it the, the secret sauce of it, is, um, is a tube-like design which allows them to bypass one of the limitations of classic fusion reactor. Uh, so uh, they're very limited to the amount of plasma they can hold, the, the present fusion reactors. And so they have to be really big to get a little bit of a reaction. Um, oh, and so, okay. uh, in fact, I believe it's, it's the old Russian model uh, fusion reactor. Um, maybe it isn't nuclear fission that I'm thinking of. I am not a physicist. <laughs> I just keep thinking of that Val Kilmer movie, The Saint. Oh, yeah. All going after the cold fusion machine. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yes, that was very exciting. And and this maybe you is lost the, me in the science. Yeah. Oh, and, and by the yeah. way, you did stay at a Holiday Inn Express last night. I did, which I makes did. me an expert on all these things. <laughs> on right. Everything. So so basically, uh, the classic fusion reactors have to be real big, mm-hmm. and uh, and so they they have to they have to be real big so they can hold this plasma to mm-hmm. help the reaction to make the reaction happen. So the architecture for the Skunk Work system is ten times smaller. And it can generate the same uh, amount of, of power as one of these big ones. And so they're expected to generate like 500 uh, milliwatts in the 2020s. So 500 milliwatts. That's, that's, <laughs> that sounds that's, like a lot. It does sound like a lot because we know that a gigawatt, <laughs> gigawatt yeah, yeah, right. would be gigawatt. more, yeah. right? I think I mean, my air conditioner used about 500 milliwatts today, trying to keep it cool. That's true. That's true. In, yeah. in, in, in the southern states, <laughs> you'd need a nuclear, a household nuclear reactor right. just to be able to power the air conditioners. It's That's true. Right. So, um, so this is crucial if you want to use fusion in all kinds of applications and not only in giant, expensive uh, fusion power plants. Mm-hmm. So, um, so they've developed this thing that's about the size of a jet engine. And so if you think about, I mean, a jet engine is a big device. Mm-hmm. But it's something that could sit in your neighborhood, mm-hmm. you know. True. And uh, and I'm actually pretty excited about it because if it's that size, then that means that you could put it inside of a spaceship, and it could power uh, a nuclear reaction for for a spaceship. You could probably fit it in a submarine, and so a submarine would have an almost unlimited fu- uh, fuel supply. Mm-hmm. Um, and then of course the the notion of maybe at some point it being involved in in running your neighborhood or even your own house. Mm-hmm. Um, and the, the thing about the, the Skunk Works design is, uh, is that it, because it doesn't work the same way that the traditional fusion models work, um, it actually doesn't have the same kind of danger uh, involved. You know? okay. Because if you think about Fukushima in Japan after the tsunami, right, right. Uh, this, this huge nuclear fallout, at Chernobyl, of course, being the most famous one yes. um, that, that we remember of antiquity, uh, but so even even that, um, there would be no big, huge radioactive cleanup since there isn't a runaway reaction that happens with traditional uh, fusion reactors. Hmm. So I'm actually kind of excited about this. They want to have this workable prototype in five uh, generations, they say. Um, so uh, they could power a cargo ship or an 80,000-home city 
Um, and it says wow. it w they're hoping to develop one that will measure 23 by 42, so you could put it on a semi-trailer, um, put it on a pad, and hook it up, have it running. Wow. Yeah, you know, there's a lot of promise here, too, for, for some of the more developing parts of the world as yes. well. Uh, folks who, who don't have clean water because they mm -hmm. don't have uh, Anything you know, a to power supply purify. or yeah, right. to purify and whatnot. So uh, that to me is I, I love the I love the sci the, the sci-fi angle and all the things that might be done with it in terms of future exploration of the galaxy. Yeah. But also just the practical application of being able to meet basic human needs, which mm -hmm. at this point I think we can all agree that power is right up there with a, a basic human need, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Especially in our day and time. And I'm th I'm thinking of disaster relief too. Ah. Um, the simplicity of bringing in something that can fit on a semi-trailer and suddenly people aren't um, struggling for clean water, like you were saying. Yeah. Um, I can see a lot of use for that, too. So right. It's very simple sure. I mean, an, uh, an 80,000 home city powered by 100 mego, uh, milliwatts mm -hmm. um, on, uh, on a semi-trailer. Mm -hmm. I mean, 80,000 homes, you get two or three of those things, and New Orleans would have been back up and running. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Uh, in an hour uh, instead of eight to ten years yeah yeah that's that's something um to, to think too that a power grid because one of the things that that our world is also very concerned with and, and to some degree rightly so is generating power in a way that is responsible right mm -hmm. and and um i think most of the time we tend to think of nuclear power because of the the, the radioactive fallout possibility as something that just shouldn't be looked at but all of a sudden it becomes a little bit more of a player mm -hmm. because it's essentially a clean power source um, if you have to use less of a of a nuclear material for a reaction, mm -hmm. and uh, and so then you have less of a problem with st with uh, storing the waste, the and, waste and, exactly. um, and the half life of, of that as well. So mm -hmm. that's actually a really cool thing. So uh, Chris, would you power your home with a, a fusion reactor? Oh, absolutely. It it doesn't concern me. Yeah, <laughs> I I think it sounds great. Yeah. Or I could just put my smallest son, Nicholas, on a hamster wheel. And that there you out. go. He does have a lot. Nicholas, uh, I can speak uh, with authority about this. Nicholas, for the first few years of his life, did not walk. He, he ran. Oh. <laughs> yeah. One That's speed. true. In, fact, in yeah. fact, his walk these days, they actually, I think they had to bring him to the, uh, the Austin Institute for slowing down. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and, uh, which is actually a place. <laughs> no, it's not. Uh, and... And even his walk has a gait like a run. Wow. It's gazelle-like. It's true. Maybe it's true. he... We're trying to teach him how to walk, literally. Yeah. Instead of just run everywhere. Mm -hmm. wow. mm -hmm. Turbo speed. So, yeah, Default sure. Setting. Nuclear nuclear power after all that? Why yeah. not? Exactly. <laughs> right. I think it would be great just to see uh, how Nicholas fares in a few years in track and field. I mean, really. Because he here. could be a clean power source. Like the little boy in The Incredibles. Exactly. That's mm -hmm. right. Like Dash. Yeah. Making my retirement on it. <laughs> that's right <laughs> yeah well you know one of the things that you shouldn't bank your retirement on but it's coming is us we're the catholic underground get coffee and help catholic underground cucast.me slash mystic monk Alrighty, you are listening to the catholic underground uh, we are cutting through the noise of the digital continent or some might say we're just creating more noise. I don't know. We talked about nuclear power for almost 10 minutes. Ago. Where's the pizza? That's right. <laughs> 30 minutes early. It's already here, Jeff. Okay. I am Father Chris Decker, joined by Olivia Galino, Jeff Blackwell, yeah, Ed Ball's in the video cave over there, and Chris Williston also joins us from, from his uh, podcast zone in Austin, Texas. And, uh, and Chris, um, we, we've certainly had you on the show before as kind of a guest host um, because, well, uh, Chris has a, a similar gift in that he can talk about anything for an extended period of time, which really is a, it's a gift. It's a blessing and a curse. I think we'd agree, right? Yes, sir. But today you were on the show not just as a guest host but also as a guest because uh, you have, uh, have, have created a, a beautiful, beautiful apostolate that's called the Mary Claire Project. And, uh, and the reason for the name and the reason for your creation of it actually have a lot to do with, uh, with your own family unit. It does. It does. Thank you, Father. I, it's an outstanding opportunity just to be here and, and talk to you guys about this. Um, so a year ago in June, my wife and I found out that we lost our, our, our fifth child, Mary mm -hmm. Claire. Uh, we went in for our 16-week appointment. And, um, and found out that we had actually lost her about three weeks before, around 13 weeks. And um, at the time, we were obviously heartbroken. Yeah. Um, but there was this little bit of, there, there was this 
this pro this thing that existed out there that that was a little bit weird. It was a little mm -hmm. bit different. It was something we didn't, you know, had kind of seen other other folks utilize and thought, you know, we'd like to do the same. And that was an opportunity to actually um, bury our daughter. Yeah. Um, Mary Claire. So there was a funeral home and a uh, cemetery up in Georgetown, which is just north of the Austin area, which would actually take possession of of the remains uh, mm -hmm. at the time that, that they were available, um, would uh, provide a small casket, would provide a small burial place in a communal bur burial garden there in a, a cemetery, Our Lady of the Rosary Cemetery in Georgetown, mm -hmm. Texas, and uh, and would deliver our daughter there uh, to us um, to to be interred. And so we, you know, thought let's let's do this. Yeah, we we did one simple post on on Facebook. I think um, kind of on a Thursday and on a Saturday morning, um, about sixty folks uh, joined us there. Wow! Uh, beside that tiny grave in Georgetown, Texas, to to remember and celebrate the life of our daughter. And you know, for us, it was just this. It was this moment as we sat there, surrounded by people, Catholic, non-Catholic, um, mm -hmm. Christian, non-Christian, um, some lifelong friends, some relatively new friends, people who just came out of the woodwork. Yeah. Um, it struck us that this was very rare, and mm -hmm. in the eyes of some, it was very, it was very kind of strange and different. But it was beautiful. Yeah. And I mean, I think even from that week, from that moment, almost immediately, I started thinking, you know, why, why is this weird? Why is this so strange? And, um, and, and it started kicking around in the back of my mind, like somebody should really do something to make these kinds of services more available. Isn't that um, usually what happens is we, we think, geez, somebody should really do something. Mm -hmm. Somebody should. And, and so for about nine months, it just kind of kicked around in the back of my head. And, and I watched as, as other friends experience yeah. similar loss. And my mm -hmm. wife, God bless her, she would get on the phone. They'd be in different parts of Texas. And, and my wife would get on the phone and, and try to, to call uh, the diocese, call Catholic cemeteries, call um, just folks who might know of something similar. And she couldn't find any similar kind of offerings in which you know somebody would just stand there and offer uh, the physical goods to help um, to help people celebrate the, the spiritual reality and the physical reality that they experienced in miscarriage. And so it kicked around for about nine months. And then one night Michelle and I were out to dinner and I said, you know, I just keep thinking about that idea that I had about, about trying to make these services more available to others. And she said, what are you talking about? <laughs> so, well, okay. I, I guess I forgot to tell you that this has been kicking around in the back of my mind for the last nine months. Here's what I think we ought to do. Here's the plan on how I think it ought to be done. And she just looked at me and decisively said, we need to do that. Yeah. Period. I find it interesting that the time in which uh, this, uh, this point of discernment just stated within right. your heart was uh, the time of uh, bringing a child to bear. Mm -hmm. That's right. That's you know, exactly. Yep. Yeah. There, there are no coincidences there. Now, um, I, I will say, uh, you know, because as you say, it is a strange thing in the world in which we live today to, to seek the remains of, of a child that has, has been miscarried. Did you find any obstacles doing that? You know, the biggest obstacles were just um, that it, it was outside of the norm of the medical process. Mm -hmm. um, in most states, and, and people may or may not know this, in most states, um, the, the, the family, the couple does have right to the remains of their child. Oh, okay. Now, there are some some states actually put up barriers um, just because of the liability reasons with the medical facilities. But in most states, all but just a handful, um, families have a right to to ask to request for the remains of their their child um, who's lost in miscarriage. Um, the biggest challenge for us was just making sure everybody was on the same page that they knew um, what our wishes were. Because of course, you know, you show up at the medical facility or um, and, and and you start going through the process and the paperwork and all that and uh, and you have to be very careful to to watch what you're signing that you're not yeah. signing away those rights and um, and because so they just say sign here right. just and, sign here mm -hmm. right and you, and you're emotional it's raw it's difficult it's challenging in so many ways and so your your instinct is kind of to go okay you're the authority you're the the medical provider just just tell me what to do and let's. Yeah. Let's just get this done because it's it's heart wrenching, and it's uh, difficult in in the medical profession today uh, to to not to to have to be on your guard. You would expect when you're in a hospital um, for any reason that they would have your uh, your soul in in their care and not just your physical beating human heart. Mm -hmm. Right, 
Right. Well, this is so this is so outside the norm that it hasn't even really entered into the thought of of most medical providers and most medical facilities. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, just just being being vigilant about making sure that um, about what you're signing, asking about what you're signing, making sure that your doctor, the nurse, yeah, uh, that everybody knows your wishes. Mm-hmm. And um, and there were a couple barriers. You know, for us, it was um, they they kind of said, well, it's you know, we're going to have to, to send remains down to the lab and they're going to have to process and it could take up to two weeks. And yeah, da, 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 da. I mean, there were there were all kinds of kind of artificial barriers that were thrown up um, that we were eventually able to get around. But um, yeah, but we just had to ask. Right. And and, and be persistent. And, and I think that may be the one of the, the bigger things uh, for those who maybe have experienced miscarriages is is to uh, is to be upfront about what your wishes are, as you say. And so, uh, once the wishes are made known, um, once you are able to uh, to receive um, the the remains of the child, this is kind of where the Mary Claire project uh, comes into focus, right? Absolutely. Yeah. So, again, we we were tremendous benefactors of um, of the gift that had been given by those who had invested in these services and offering them um, free of charge. Uh, because obviously I mean, there's, there's a lot of expense anytime you're doing anything medical and having, yeah. um, multiple thousands of dollars of funeral expenses or, or cemetery expenses piled on, on top of medical expenses, uh, could make it cost prohibitive, um, to, yeah, to because use these kind of services. It, it is one of those things where, uh, it is not simply a, a free thing. Mm-hmm. Anytime mm-hmm. you go to a funeral home, right. I mean, mm-hmm. you're looking at at least like a $1,200 situation, if not more. Yeah, you really are. So, yeah, what the Mary Claire Project seeks to do, um, there, you know, there are three major physical needs that that folks experience during this time. They need uh, someone to help them uh, prepare remains for burial. Um, they need something in which to bury um, yeah. the body, um, and they need a place to bury. Pretty mm-hmm. simple thing. So, um, we are actually um, in, working in partnership um, with um, with funeral homes who are willing to offer their services free of charge to families experiencing this loss. Um, the Mary Claire project itself has actually taken over uh, the building of these caskets um, in which these children are buried. Uh, they're small, they're wood, they're beautiful. Um, the gentleman who made the casket in which Mary Claire is buried actually made it by hand. He's just an employee of the, um, of the, of the funeral home. Oh, wow. And he makes each and every one of them by hand. It takes him an hour to make them. They provide him the materials, but he just does it out of the goodness of his heart. And uh, but he's seventy years old. Mm-hmm. He's seventy years old, and um, and he does it joyfully. But we didn't know how long he'd be able to do it. So sure, yeah. Time one the, is one of those things that's not that, that is always ticking. Mm-hmm. You know? yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So one of the first things we said as the project is uh, we're going to uh, we're going to step in and start making these these wooden caskets uh, for families who experience the loss. Um, and and we engaged a, a wood shop. Um, the gentleman who ran the wood shop actually had just lost a grandchild and, oh, wow. and, um, had had the grandchild buried through the same program and, and was so willing to step up. So there we go. We've got someone to help. We've got some, we've got something in which to, uh, to bury the children. And, uh, and so now we're just looking for additional partnerships with cemeteries right now inside the state of Texas. Although I, I fully anticipate the day in which we will be looking for partnerships all over the country yeah. uh, to just provide a place, um, for families to go. I, I can't even, I mean, I just can't underestimate. I, I can't, I'm sorry, I can't overstate. Let me say that how important it is to us as a family to have a place that we can go and take our children yeah. and, mm-hmm. and, and say, here's your sister. Mm-hmm. She was That's a person. Right. She lived, she died. Um, that's the reality, but we, but we sell a brief life. That's right. And that's the thing about time as well, is that however long we're given, whether it's a, a, a period of many years or whether it is only a few moments um, in the womb, uh, we believe that each life is sacred and each life has a purpose. Mm-hmm. And, um, and I think what's really kind of beautiful about the Mary Claire Project is that it came to birth um, because of the witness of a child who who uh, who herself lived only a very short time, right. and and that in and of itself shows very much that God's design works even in the midst of tragedy. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. and I think that's one of the things I love about this. I mean, we were talking before the show about one of the reasons that Fulton Sheen I think is so popular is because he makes sense. Yep. You know, he's very right. r- rational. He's very logical, and I think that applies here too. You know, it's something. It makes sense. 
that um, that a child dies and you bury the child. Yes. Um, exactly. And if we believe, as we do, that um, the child um, that a, a child comes into existence at conception and is a fully human being, yep. fully human uh, person, then it makes sense that if that child dies in the womb, just as if it dies outside the womb, you bury him or her. Yeah. Um, and so I, so I, I love that. It's just merely for the fact that it makes sense, but also because it is such a thing of comfort to have a yeah. physical place to go. We're very physical creatures. So have a physical place to go to and commune with the physical aspect of your of your child and, and, right. and be in communion. But I'm wondering, um, my question is kind of a, d- a dual question. So if He's ready. Y'all, y'all can have I'm it. Um, <laughs> is, um, I, I don't know um, if, 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 you, if your apostolate is mainly geared towards like Catholic families, it seems to be a very uh, you know, Catholic theme of, uh, of respect for life. But I'm wondering, you know, if, if you, if, is it a fully, you know, Catholic funeral? And, it, and if, if, it, if it is, I'm assuming, then, you know, Father Chris, like, would that be something that you, I mean, maybe have you, have you been approached to do that before? Or I'm just wondering yeah. about, like, that aspect of it. Yeah, I mean, uh, I know that any time that, that people have come forward uh, to me, uh, to, to seek a, a funeral ritual for a child that's been miscarried, that you certainly may do that. Right. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Um, most of those funerals uh, that I've done, I think I might have done one or two, and, and they were, I believe they were graveside. So we basically mm-hmm. did the funeral ritual at the graveside. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it, it didn't take place in the church. It certainly could have, mm-hmm. you know, um, because there, there used to be so many stigmas about, uh, um, as the Cajuns would say, who can be passed through to church, <laughs> you know, um, but, uh, but certainly you could sell, uh, celebrate, uh, a full, um, a full, full funeral liturgy with the mass and everything. Um, but, but that is uh, certainly up to, up to the parents. Um, because sometimes as you can imagine, um, th- there's a lot of weight on the soul, you oh, know? Yeah. And, uh, and so sometimes a more abbreviated uh, liturgy is what's called for. But it's, it's one of those things that, at least from the priest's standpoint, um, it's, it's open to the discernment of the family as well as, uh, uh, you know, what perhaps is more appropriate for the situation. Mm-hmm. Um, and actually, Chris, I, I don't know the answer to that question because I don't know um, uh, what you, you all sought. Yeah, for us, uh, actually, we just did a, a small graveside celebration, yeah. um, kind of a rite of burial mm-hmm. yeah. um, there. Uh, and that's, you know, that's really the beautiful thing about this, Olivia, is it's, it's, it's nonpartisan, it's right. non-denomination. Yeah. Um, the reality is um, that anybody who knows a family who's experiencing this loss um, knows that, that they're mourning. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And yeah. all of the debates that we engage in about when life begins or when it doesn't begin, what, what is, it, all of that fades away. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It is just a family knows loss in yeah. that time. And so, um, whereas we obviously kind of brought our own our own Catholic faith into the celebration of this life, um, the Mary Claire Project it really exists for anybody. Mm-hmm. Um, it exists for anybody who wants to celebrate that life under any circumstances. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, now, clearly, we we will be partnering with with cemeteries in which um, I think the only kind of requirement of of the cemeteries that we've that we've dealt with is that there is some kind of Abra- Abrahamic symbol on the burial markers. Mm-hmm. So, um, huh. but that could even be a rainbow or mm-hmm. some, something mm-hmm. else. I mean, that's very, very broad when you get into, to, to cemetery terms. Um, but, uh, but yeah, just, just basically, um, we, we're acknowledging something basically human. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that is that life existed, um, that life unfortunately came to a premature end mm-hmm. and that that life deserves to be celebrated. Mm-hmm. And I think everyone can, can appreciate that. Oh, definitely. So, so if I can ask personally, um, sure. uh, what, what has this done for your family to be able to celebrate uh, the brief life of Mary Claire? Yeah. Um, you know, my kids talk about her a lot. Mm-hmm. Wow. They, they talk about her a lot. Um, they draw pictures uh, of our family with her mm-hmm. uh, in, it, in them. Um, yeah. She is a part of our family, yeah. and I'm not saying that that couldn't have happened or wouldn't have happened if we'd gone through just a, a, a standard medical procedure in which, um, you know, her remains were disposed of, uh, as yeah. it were. 
Um, but I think it would be more difficult. It would it would make her more ethereal and yeah. less physical. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And uh, and so it's hard for me to imagine that that they would have the same connection to her mm-hmm. as they do. Yeah. You know, there's something so beautiful uh, that that John Paul II encapsulates in the in the theology of the body, and that is the connection between the physical and the spiritual. Mm-hmm. And any time that we try to to divorce those two things from one another, we do so to our peril. Mm-hmm. And um. And, and this really is just an acknowledgement of that, that there is something that, yes, the, the spirit, the soul is, is, is lost or, or returned back to God in heaven, um, but that the body did exist yeah. and the body ought to be um, uh, kind of celebrated sure. in the same way that the soul is celebrated. And yeah. the body will continue to exist in the exactly. resurrection of the body. And yeah. that's the thing. Uh, I know um, it's, it's very popular nowadays uh, for, for parishioners to request, uh, request cremation mm-hmm. um, mm-hmm. just because for the longest time the Catholic Church uh, discouraged it. Right. Um, but the reason that it did was because uh, it is a more full sign to have the body present right. at mm-hmm. the funeral mass because it it it, uh, it suggests it, our body becomes a symbol of of what will happen. Our body, mm-hmm. our our corpse becomes a sacramental in that moment, where where we uh, our dead body mm-hmm. is a symbol of what the Lord will raise up in a glorified form. Mm-hmm. And uh, and so that's actually what the church teaches today is that while cremation is not forbidden. Um, it is preferable, if possible, that the body be present right. for the celebration of the funeral mass, because our body that that becomes um, it becomes a, a not a, a that becomes a thing, if you will, mm-hmm. itself is raised to the dignity of sacramental, right. because it becomes a full sign of of the time in which sacraments will not need to hold it any mm-hmm. longer; it will be glorified. So, what a great what a great and beautiful um, apostolate this is. Mm-hmm. To, to be able to to celebrate the fact that that we are we are set aside from the moment of our conception and even after death our body is set aside as something holy mm-hmm. that's why cemeteries are holy ground you exactly. know um, and so uh, Chris what a, a, a beautiful thing uh, certainly indeed and uh, and of course uh, obligatorily uh, I know that that you guys have many ways in which people can find out more. And one of the things that I would be interested to see is uh, those who are listening to us or watching us uh, all over the country, um, can they get information about how they might uh, set up something in, in their own to maybe be an affiliate of the Mary Claire Project? Sure. Yeah, we would love to hear from you. Um, you, can, you can find all of our information at our website. It's just www.maryclaireproject.com. That's M-A-R-Y-C-L-A-I-R-E project.com, maryclaireproject.com. Um, come and, and all the contact information is there on the page. We'd love to hear from you. We'd love to assist you in any way we can. Um, this is not something that's proprietary to, to us or our area. Um, we just, we believe that this ought to be ubiquitous. We believe yeah. that it ought to be everywhere and, um, and that these kinds of celebrations of life should not be, uh, abnormal, but they should be the norm. Mm-hmm. And, um, and so we'd love to help in any way we can. We'd love to hear from you. And and that's uh, as uh, as they say in um, in evening prayer and in the ordination rite. May God, who has begun the good work in you, bring it to completion, mm-hmm. um, because that is um, that is, is something that is needed and it is an important witness in in our world uh, that is asking those uh, finally asking some of those deeper questions about um, if life begins here mm-hmm. at conception, what does that mean? Mm-hmm. And uh, and this is a way to join um, that uh, that kind of that reasonable thing happening in the brain with uh, what we are hardwired for, which is an experience of God, an experience of faith. Mm-hmm. And uh, and so, Chris, uh, certainly as a as a friend of the underground, um, but also as as a husband and as a father, um, we thank you for your witness. And uh, and I thank Michelle, your wife, for saying yes. Mm-hmm. I thank you, Father. Yes, indeed. Uh, and so again, uh, Mary Claire C L A I R E Project dot com is uh, is the web address, and you will find out everything uh, there that you need to know to maybe become uh, an affiliate. And uh, and and I happen to know that 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 Chris is is almost always uh, connected to some internet enabled device, and so he will be in touch with you uh, as well. Well, uh, we move from this beautiful and wonderful apostolate to that uh, lighthearted time of the show that we like to call. The CU Pick of the Week. All right, for our first CU Pick of the Week, uh, why don't we go over to Olivia because she's always got something interesting. Well, I hope you find it interesting. I do. I, I do. In fact, I, I click those links later. 
perfect. I do. That makes so. me happy. Yeah, my pick of the week this week is uh, the Little Free Library. Mm. Um, maybe in your neighborhood they have them all, kind of in a lot they of look big like a little cities. mailbox kind of thing. Yeah, it's like a, a cross between a mailbox and a birdhouse. Um, but you may see these in some neighborhoods, and you look in, and there's books in there. Um, and they call them little free libraries, and they're just neighborhood tiny libraries. And it's a kind of a take a book, give a book um, system. So um, I, I, I need a bookcase shaped. Uh, yeah. <laughs> a whole some of them, bookcase. yeah, and they, they have different shapes. Some of them look like little school Oh, and houses. some are very large, actually. That's good. That's what I would need. Yeah, with, yeah. A, with a, a couple of different levels yep. to them. That's what I need. I need it organized. No. Um, <laughs> Dewey Decimal. I do love this system because it's, it's you know, maybe you don't have time to go to the bookstore. Or maybe you don't have the money to spend on, you know, the, the most recent bestseller. Right. Maybe um, you're not near a library or something like right. that. Yeah. Or maybe you need a passive recommendation on a good book. Yeah. Um, and that's the perfect place to go. Um, and so people will put these in their lawns. Um, I don't know if it's really kosher to put them on public property. That's something that the FAQs might help you with. You probably have to ask your civil authorities. Yeah, I think you yeah. might need a permit for that. But um, <laughs> but it's really, I love this. I love the system. I love the idea of it. It's something that I wish I had close to where I live because I would use it all the time. Um, and I, I think it's a great way to encourage people to actually read, um, yeah. which is something that we're losing. I think so. Uh, in fact, uh, I'm, I'm quite elated that Olivia and I spend a good deal of time before the show talking about books we want to read. Yeah. <laughs> um, it makes me feel not so much of a geek, uh, or at least equally a geek with somebody else in the studio. Equally geeked. Equally geeked, yeah. And, uh, and one of the beautiful things is um, rediscovering reading after graduating. Yes. You know? I mm-hmm. have, I have, that was the only thing that encouraged me, really, at, towards the end of my college career to graduate, was the list of books that I had made that I was going to read after yeah. I graduated. Amen. And Chris <laughs> is a reader, too. I mean, Chris, uh, uh, not only are you reading your kids every night, which I think is awesome, yes. by the way, um, but, uh, you. But, but you have a pretty stately library you're building. Yes, yes. I, I really I can't get enough reading time. Um, and I, I happened upon one of these little free libraries for the first time the other day on on public grounds. In, okay, in, in in a, but it's awesome. Yeah. No, no, this nope. was in Sulphur Springs, Texas, in a oh. little beautiful idyllic town square. And I mm. thought it was one of the coolest things I've ever seen before in my life. <laughs> um, so I quickly removed all of the Books of Mormon that they had in there, and everything <laughs> else was just great. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> no, it was just really neat. I mean, I, I never seen these things, and it's just it's a cool little yeah, you know, knowledge and uh, and mm-hmm. and opportunity. You'd for be food. the hottest house on your block, I think, if you had one of those book bird houses in your front yard. That's right. I think if I could put one of those and or a red box out there, we. <laughs> That's right, a little residual income, <laughs> just a little something, you know. Right. I'll, uh, yeah. I'll run a little uh, cable cord out there for the internet. So yeah, there you go. The red box, and we'll be good to go. Just put your head under the hood, and you got a movie coming at you. Done. Well, how about when you're not reading? How about your pick of the week? <laughs> My pick of the week this week. All right, I've got to tell you guys. On Friday, I got home from work, and I was or not, where? Did, okay, there's a little backstory to this. <laughs> Let me just say this. I have been on a little bit of a nostalgia kick lately, and that is because I I happened into a video game store in the mall recently, and I saw a Nintendo Entertainment System, the legitimate thing from 1985, eight bits of glory. And suddenly, and there, and there before me were all of the plastic cartridges, and and I resisted the urge to blow into each and every one of them to make them work correctly. That's right. right. Um, but uh, so my pick of the week this week is actually uh, nostalgia themed because uh, because I found recently um, the the uh, website archive.org, org which oh, you sure. can just type in Internet Arcade just Google search that and the first one that will come up will be an archive dot org page and basically if you are a kid who oh, or no. I'm sorry if you are an adult who grew up in the late eighties nineties and today um, then every <laughs> PC game every PC game that you can imagine from your childhood is probably in the internet internet arcade. If you are ready to go suit up and and travel the Oregon Trail in all (laughs) 8-bit glory, you can do so right now. And uh, Wolfenstein 3D, all those first-person shooter games, not that I advocate playing those, but just the ones that, that we all played because they were just, we were so enamored with them back in 1992, they're all there. So oh I'm sorry, and you're welcome. Uh, this is terrible. <laughs> sorry, I know. not sorry, right? Yeah. I'm not. 
Sorry. Oh my goodness. It Jeff, is a rabbit hole. Jeff Blackwell <laughs> is going to be all over that. I can just tell. Oh yeah. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. But but you also, Jeff, have been enamored of of a really cool channel that I want to check out. Yeah, and uh, the photography is incredible. Let me just start out by saying that it's planes, trains, and the plus sign automobiles. Planes, trains, and automobiles. Or you can find it at the PTA. Dot com. Um, the, one of the things in watching this, um, and it was in a hotel room uh, a couple of weeks ago, I was flipping across and I saw this beautiful photography of a country I've never seen before. Um, uh, but uh, they have, you know, full length uh, programs, uh, the uh, people traveling different areas. If you check out the, if you just go to the page, you'll see there's different uh, things that, that you can, you can take a look at. Uh, but the postcards are the ones that really just caught my eye because these are short little two three minute clips but they are filled with all kinds of interesting photography and and some are you know uh, places where everybody's been and some that you never heard of but the music is original the photography is just very it's well beautiful. done and yeah. uh, uh i would say uh, check it out i haven't found anything that's uh, that that offends me as far as a catholic uh and it's uh, it's just really well done the pta.com I, I like the fact that there is a Roku channel for this. Yes, Roku and so, uh, Amazon Fire as well. So, so yeah. right alongside the CU Television app, you can have the planes, trains, and all the channel and switch mm -hmm. back and forth. Yeah. <laughs> Which, by the way, I don't know if we've mentioned we have a Roku channel. Um, if you'd like to see us live every week in the video, um, if you want to get all of our, um, our our podcasts so you can listen while you're cleaning house, mm. um, you can do that uh, on Roku if you search for uh, Catholic Underground Television or CU Television. Um, I'm actually really excited about that because it's working. It's yes, working. It's, it's working. <laughs> it's I can actually see live. it right now in the other room. Oh, you can oh, see it. Yeah, you can see right. it working. I'm looking at Blackwell from like three minutes ago. <laughs> <laughs> Which uh, Jeff does time travel uh, through the magic of Roku. That's you are tra I'm traveling. Now. Literally. So my pick of the week in 1977, the two Voyager spacecraft were launched with a 12-inch gold-plated copper record containing images and sounds of Earth yeah. uh, for the advanced civilization, which will eventually find one of them gifts sentence to them and name it Beecher. But you <laughs> right. can now listen to those uh, on SoundCloud. NASA has made it available from nice. English to Hittite to Polish to Thai. Um, all of, uh, of the, the greetings and the language that went on the record, uh, mm -hmm. those are there uh, for you to listen to on SoundCloud. Also, what's really cool is a NASA SoundCloud account. If you've ever wondered what the universe sounds like when uh -huh. you're not looking, it's there. Nice. Uh, so yeah, that's that's my pick of the week. I'm I, I I listen to them all. I don't I don't speak Hindi, but it was really cool to think that somewhere Viger is uh, is playing this record back. <laughs> I, that's really cool. Uh, so so yeah, we uh, we always say that uh, the Catholic Underground is possible because of people like you. Yes. If you want to join the growing number of undergrounders, you can go to CatholicUnderground.com/slash/donate and help us out. Yes. And also, portions of the Catholic Underground are brought to you by audibletrial.com slash Catholic Underground. It's audibletrial.com slash Catholic Underground. And also by Mystic Monk Coffee. That's right. More information at catholicunderground.tv. Yes, One indeed. minute, Father. If you want the show notes that accompany this episode and the podcast feed and all that, go to catholicunderground.com. If you want to sign up for whenever we're going to have a live show, you can follow at CUTV Live on Twitter. Search for us on Roku, Catholic Underground. Our panelists have been Olivia Galino at OM Galino. Uh, Chris Williston joins us from Austin, Texas. He's at MaryClaireProject.com. And Jeff Blackwell joins us. He's at Jeff Blackwell Us. All righty. Uh, Ed Ball is uh, our video director and our research assistant and leader of the boys in the lab is Jim Hayes. You know me. I'm Father Chris Decker. We hope we've helped you cut through the noise. We are the Catholic Underground. We are Faith Gone Digital, and we will see you next time. From the Catholic.